Thanks, Kirsten. So hopefully through the previous slides, it's given you a flavor, I guess, about both why we actually need a row hierarchy, why do we need to come about these things from a planning perspective, and a little bit about how the frameworks that we use to think about these concepts has evolved over time, and perhaps what that next evolution is, which is really about movement in place. So the topic that we'll talk through today, and the case study in particular, is the Streamlining Hoddle Street project. So it's a project that I worked on for around about uh, three years, from I guess, 2015 to 2018, and that was really involved in the business case development for this particular project. A little bit of background to what it actually is, and some of you may already be aware of this. Obviously, Hoddle Street's a popular part of Melbourne, and it's a, a route that a lot of people would commonly traverse or travel along in, in their journeys throughout a week. Effectively, the importance of this corridor was recognised to uh, the Labor government back in 2013, who were then in opposition. They provided a commitment to improve the corridor, and that commitment fundamentally focused on uh, efficiency of the corridor, and particularly using uh, innovative intersection treatments, which hadn't been done before in, in Australia, as well as uh, increased use of enhanced traffic management systems. I guess that was also supplemented by Vic Rose's investigation into this sort of space over the last perhaps uh, 10 years, I would say. So with Labor being elected um, into government in late 2014, there was a commitment of $1.8 million to this streamlining Hoddle Street initiative. So our role commenced in 2015, I think it was, in the mid part of 2015, after the government was uh, on board. And really, one of the first things that we needed to do before we actually go about applying a road hierarchy or developing up concepts for planning for this particular corridor was to understand what the problems were that we are actually seeking to address. So there were four key problems for this corridor that were identified. So one of those was the delay to all users using the Doncaster Area Rapid Transit Services, so the uh, bus network that connects Doncaster into the CBD. The second problem there was about the inefficient operation of intersections. So you can see in the top right hand corner, it's an output from the traffic signal system called SCATS, and that shows 10 separate phases for some intersections on Hollow Street at the moment, whereas other intersections in the city, in the inner city, actually operate on two phases. And so there's a whole lot of inefficiency potentially that is a resulting as a, as a process of trying to accommodate all the different movements in all the different um, parts of the system rather than looking to streamline things. The third problem there was about road safety. So road safety on the corridor is poor. There's 50% more crashes than any other comparable arterial road that has a similar cross-sectional width. And then the last point there was um, the environment for pedestrians and cyclists. So really um, not a place that people want to be fundamentally, even uh, travelling along the corridor, but also travelling across the corridor. There's some really important activity centres and important cultural hubs of Melbourne that are either side of Hoddle Street, but Hoddle Street doesn't reflect that in terms of its design or operation. So we understand what the problems are, and then I guess there's a, a philosophical idea about how we're actually going to um, approach this problem. So there were previous studies that were undertaken before our were engaged with this piece of work um, about five years prior, which highlighted potentially long-term solutions uh, that were both extremely expensive and able to be justified in the short term. So with that greater pressure on funding, you know, it's always more difficult to be able to keep up with the demands for funding as our city is continuing to evolve, as well as the long time frame for that type of city shaping project. There needs to be more of a focus on network operations fundamentally. So we need to do more with what we have. This concept is represented in the chart here. So you can see obviously in the 1960s and 70s, there was a big focus on building, but more recently, a lot more time and effort and money, resources being put into operations. So that idea about sweating the asset or doing more with what we already have. So that can be done in a number of ways. So some of that's through better utilization of the existing infrastructure and the other way is through the integration of technology with what we do. So we understand the problem. We understand, I guess, the approach that we're looking to take to do more with what we already have. The next key step was understanding what a hierarchy would be that might actually support that. So what are the outcomes that we're fundamentally looking to achieve? We want to do more with the things that we already have. We probably want to look at the idea of innovative intersections. We want to integrate the use of technology, but to what end? So which users are we actually trying to service? So there was a key step here about looking to define the road hierarchy for the whole street corridor and its environs. So we go through here, you'll see a series of um, pop-ups that show the different modes. 
So our first key step was understanding, you know, where are those really important hubs of Melbourne, those cultural hubs of Melbourne, um, that have a really significant and vibrant role in our community. And it's important that we protect them basically in terms of what their current functions actually are. And we actually supplement that with um, improvements to what we do to Hoddle Street to actually make sure it's meeting with the objectives of these activity centres. I guess in, in contrast to that perhaps is um, you know, one of the major impacts on those activity centres would actually be um, too much additional traffic being pushed through those centres. It would uh, degrade basically the environment and suitability for pedestrians. So we really needed to come at this from an angle of saying, okay, well, if we're not going to look to move some of those people through those activity centres, um, we need to actually think about how otherwise they might actually move um, around these activity centres. And then particularly, what is the role of Hoddle Street fundamentally? So obviously people know it and they use it in lots of different ways, but fundamentally Hoddle Street is a bypass of Melbourne CBD. It allows people to travel around there in combination with a few other routes like uh, the Eastern and the Monash, uh, the big boulevard and, uh, and the Westgate actually. That's the way that people are actually using the corridor at the moment. So how do we actually enhance that and how do we uh, recognise that role in terms of the way that we look to augment it? Another key consideration, clearly from a modal perspective, is the role of cycling. Um, so clearly Hoddle Street is not a suitable environment for cyclists and um, I don't think there's the opportunity necessarily to augment it in that kind of way. But it, how do we use the wider network to provide cycling movements both along and across the corridor? So you can see a couple of parallel routes that have been identified here in our planning. Trams are probably obviously um, much less uh, flexible in terms of how we can accommodate them, but there's a need to represent and recognise that in a road hierarchy sense, they have a really important role to play, particularly travelling across the corridor. So the things that we do in terms of augmenting this network needs to make sure that we can improve the outcomes for trams and their travel time reliability across the corridor. And lastly, buses. So you can see the Doncaster area, rapid transit services, which are coming from the Eastern Freeway and then connecting down Victoria Parade that uh, move a lot of people into the city in lieu of the rail line out to Doncaster. But then there's also important bus services that run up and down the corridor. So the 246 bus um, is one of the highest patronage uh, services in Melbourne. And we need to recognise that in terms of the way that we actually provide um, for augmentation of this network uh, to be able to improve bus priority along the corridor. So I guess when you put these different layers on, you can see that there's complexity to what goes on. But it's really important to set that strategy as to well, what are we actually trying to achieve for this corridor. All right, so the network strategy that we defined in the previous slide and spent a bit of time there was then applied down at the local intersection level. So to talk through that a little bit more specifically, we have the pedestrian priority area, the Swan Street, and the key activity centre and cultural hub of Melbourne. We also have cycling priority across the corridor. So really important to make sure that we consider that in any designs that we come up with. Uh, tram priority across the corridor, so connecting uh, Swan Street and beyond to the CBD and the sports precinct. And then we've got the 246 bus that I mentioned there. So how do we provide for better movements um, along the corridor? And then finally, a really important part of that is um, looking to prioritise the movements for not necessarily traffic in all directions, but particularly north-south along the corridor in terms of that strategic north-south function that Hull Street and Punt Road have, as well as uh, the movements from the west and to the north and vice versa in terms of bypassing the CBD. So I guess with that, those priorities, I guess, uh, laid down for the local intersection, we then went about our design work. Now, the types of concepts that we actually brought into this are uh, probably a topic for a whole other lecture around uh, continuous flow intersections and some of those sorts of things. But we're not going to focus on that so much uh, for today. We're really looking about how this strategy then looked to augment the next work. So you can see here, this is what the proposal was that we actually developed. And you can see some of the key features there that are aligning back to our strategy. So we look to remove some of the left turn slip lanes to improve pedestrian conditions in and around this area. Uh, we look to run a shorter cycle length, so making sure that the wait time for pedestrians is reduced along with that. We're proposing upgraded cycling facilities east-west along the corridor. Additional bus priority in sections that you can see there, um, shown where it mentions additional bus priority to move buses up and down the corridor. And then moving trams into their own reserve, a new dedicated uh, facility for that, uh, removing some of the parking that uh, uh, contributes to interrupting tram movements towards the 
Bridge near Richmond Station, as well as providing tram stops, improved tram stops uh, local to the intersection. Some of the other key features which are again associated with this idea of continuous flow intersections, in this case an inverted CFI, was to look to figure out which movements to promote and which ones to discourage. So again, back to our strategy, as this type of system looks to promote the southbound right turn movement that you can see there in the green, as well as north-south movements along the corridor. So it allows us to simplify the operation of these intersections, moving it back to a two-phase intersection, which basically means then you need to figure out what you're going to provide more time to, and in this case it's for those two strategic movements, north-south along the corridor, and then between the west and north approaches. The other key factor here is that to achieve that simplification of the operation is to figure out which movements are less important and which ones you want to discourage. And again, we've talked a fair bit about Swan Street and its importance. So in this case, to access Swan Street, you'd actually need to turn left to do a U-turn and travel um, in towards Swan Street to the, to the east that you can see there in the marker that's shown there in the pink. So that's discouraging those movements, traveling straight into the activity center. All right, so now I'll uh, present you a video that was basically the outcome of our work that gives you um, a further overview of what our work was looking to achieve and give some of those ideas of road hierarchy put down into context and how that's been applied then at the local level to inform our design. The first stage of the streamlining Hoddle Street initiative will make your journey along and across Hoddle Street safer and more reliable. This corridor is a critical link to the Eastern, Monash, City Link and Westgate freeways and a connection between the city and the inner suburbs. Each day, 330,000 people travel along or across Hoddle Street. At the Swan Street intersection, large numbers of vehicles, trams, buses, cyclists and pedestrians compete for space on the road. That is why it has been chosen as the site to pilot this new concept a continuous flow intersection. Continuous flow intersections allow more people to travel through a green light by changing when and where right turns are made. This means better traffic flow for all road users. The new Swan Street intersection will transform your journey. So I guess that gives you a little bit of an overview about what the actual project was and some of the things it looked to achieve. If you're looking for any further information on this, you can see a couple of uh, links that we've shown there as well as some more information about some of the concepts we've talked about earlier on today around smart roads and, and uh, movement in place increasingly in Victoria. Uh, we also have some opportunities to come and work at Arab, so our grad program is open. Um, if you're keen and you've liked what you've heard about today, uh, I encourage you to apply using that link below. If you have any questions as well, please shout out to either Kirsten or myself. Thank you. <laughs>